Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 91, Conflict Resolution. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my mature and diplomatic co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing pretty well. So how was your week this week? Uh, pretty stressful. Yeah? Yeah, I had a lot of stuff for school, especially coming back from the break and honestly, I'm just glad it's the weekend now, so I can at least have some type of relaxation, even though I still have work I need to do. Well, and that's the thing. You kind of have to make up for that short week with uh, the holiday and everything when you come back, right? I guess. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about conflict resolution. This was actually a topic that you wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, you had gone over some of this in uh, school a few Oh, geez, I guess it's a few months back now, right? I think so, maybe. Yeah, it's been a while. So, uh, kind of an interesting topic, one that I think everyone can benefit from. It's not just a teen thing, uh, but we'll get into that. We'll talk about what conflict is, why does it occur, what are some of the consequences, and some of the complications conflict, uh, being a teenager uh, in conflict comes with. Then we're going to talk about uh, some conflict resolution commandments, which some of these I think kind of fell in with what you had talked about in school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then we will talk about uh, the steps to conflict resolution, which I think you know ultimately is the important thing here, right? We all have to compromise, and in in this day of uh, political strife, I think compromise is something we could all use some lessons on. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, though, I would invite folks to subscribe to us. You can get our video versions of our podcast listed as Insights into Things. You can get our audio versions listed as Insights into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and Pandora. We would also invite folks to uh, contact us, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing. If we're doing anything wrong, what you'd like us to talk about, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter, we're at insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things, or you can get links to all those plus show notes, transcripts, and all of our shows on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Now that all the boring stuff's done, you ready to get into it? Sure, why not? All right, let's go. So, why does conflict occur? Now, there's a lot of different reasons for it. The source that we're using here is one we've used in the past called momjunction.com. And the first thing they say is conflict's a part of life. And we know that most recently now that conflict is part of life, but it's not restricted to just humans, right? Tell us a little bit about that with our new edition. Oh, yeah. So um, last week we talked about the newest addition to our family, Pumpkin, um, in our last podcast. And um, we kind of touched on it before, but um, this week was Liberation Week. Before, Pumpkin had to stay in my room. That way she would be more comfortable in my room, help, and we would bond together. And, uh, this week was the first time where she was fully liberated. And, uh, she's come in contact with the other cats, and, um, let's just say 
they definitely get into a lot of conflict, especially Pumpkin and Dorothy. Dorothy is shown to be the alpha cat. She wants to be the alpha cat. But seeing, but seeing her interact with Pumpkin, it seems she's afraid of Pumpkin, so a bit of irony there. Right. Leota, she, like, as long as Pumpkin doesn't get in her personal space, she can deal with it. But whenever she does, she does get into a bit of a hissy fit. Right. Now, the reason I mention that is that conflict is really part of human nature, and it has been for, for eons. Uh, but the site goes on to say that no matter how much you want to protect your child from it, he or she has to face the reality that conflict is going to happen. And conflict can occur with family, with siblings, parents, friends, with society, or between kittens, apparently. <laughs> One thing you need to teach your teenagers is that conflicts need not be a negative experience. And I think that probably catches a lot of people off guard is that, you know, a conflict is not a fight. A conflict could be a difference of opinions. It could be a debate on certain topics. So conflicts themselves aren't necessarily a bad thing. And it's important to understand that when there is a conflict of some nature, that you can make it a positive experience. You can make it a learning experience. You can make it an educational experience overall. And remember that conflict can lead to change, and change can be positive. So, for instance, if we're talking about, I don't know, uh, you might like, uh, I, had, I had an example before the show, and I can't think of it now. But, like, you have an example on how you want the furniture arranged in your room, okay? And I might think differently. You might want, you know, your bed in a certain spot because it gives you better light. And I might suggest we put the bed in a different spot that gives you more room. And there's positives and negatives to both. And you might not have explored the aspects that I had. And at that point in time, it's a conflict, but it's not a fight, right? Yeah. So you may, because of your listening to me during this, during the conversation of the conflict, you may see things from a different point of view and try something different. It might turn out better. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we need to keep in mind here. So consequences of teen conflicts, they also go into that and they say without the necessary skill set. A teenager cannot land in tough situations, or a teenager can land in tough situations when it comes to conflicts. And I think this comes to just about any kind of interaction that you would normally have, right? Like if you don't know how to speak in public and you have an assignment where you have to speak in public, you're going to panic. You're going to not be able to do it well, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the conflict resolution skills that you learned from the course in school. Well, one of the things they talked about was to have to, if you and one person are in a conflict and you're both very standing on your opinions, you can call in some someone called a mediator. And the mediator is basically an outside person that wasn't involved in the conflict to begin with. So they can hear both sides and think and think of a way to help both sides, either with a win-win solution or a compromise. And that's a role that you've played quite frequently with your friends, right? Mm -hmm. Where you may have two friends that are in conflict with each other and you step in and mediate that discussion. and try to get them to agree on things what it you know describe a situation that you've had to do that in where it's turned out in a positive light well um for one of the instances my friends um basically have misunderstandings with each other my one friend kind of gets emotional at certain things and my other friend doesn't fully understand it um, so whenever my one friend would get emotional and the other one and my other friend wouldn't be able to understand it, I'd be the mediator and try to help them work it out. Like, I tell my one emotional friend that, hey, it's okay, it happens, you just need to learn how to handle it, and I teach my other friend, hey, this happens to her, you don't, um, you might not fully understand it, but you might want to do it in order to help her out. Right. 
Now, conflicts can happen at home, where unresolved conflicts can lead to strained relationships. One of the conflicts that we had recently was the, de the debate about whether or not we were going to get another kitten. Now, I did not want to get one. Obviously, you and Mommy did, so I was outvoted there, number one. But the compromise that we came to was, you know, we came to terms on how we were going to get the kitten, what kind of kitten we were going to get, you know, what your role in taking care of the kitten was. So to resolve that conflict, we, we all came to terms with that. And we understood that, okay, it's not just fun and games. It's a responsibility thing. It's going to be a learning lesson for you. You're going to take care of the cat. We're going to get a certain kind of cat that'll bond to you. So that's how we resolve that conflict. Uh, do you think that conflict resolution solution that we came up with is working out so far? I mean, yeah. Um, I definitely have learned to take responsibility. And in fact, I actually feel like I'm a real parent because I've been having like these little panic attacks when pumpkins leaving the nest as if like your own child was going and doing their own thing, going out for school, and, like, since she was no longer under my guard and I knew the other cats weren't particularly kind with her, I got so panicked the one day of liberation that I ended up locking her in for the night. Oh, wow, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I got so panicked with it that, like, I just... <laughs> I got a... I, I got connected to her, just like... a. Just like a mother would connect with their child. Exactly, yeah. I just, like, <laughs> I started getting these parental feelings that you'd kind of get with your own family, with yeah. your own um, child. And, and that's good. That's exactly what we, were, what we were hoping for. The other thing they talk about is that conflicts can be outside of the family, outside of, of your immediate circle. And when this happens, it can lead to broken friendships. It can lead to detention in school, and it can even lead to violence. So being able to resolve conflicts with, with other people is important, and it's more difficult because you might not know what they're willing to do to compromise or how interested they are in resolving the issue. Uh, have you had any conflicts outside of family, anything from school or friends or anything like that, where you've ran in the issues where you couldn't resolve these and, and it's caused friendships or anything. I mean, yeah, especially in sixth grade. That was probably one of the hardest years of school in my life. Um, back then, I really, I was kind of the problem because I had no way of controlling my emotions back then. I would lash out. And honestly, it did sometimes cost my, it did sometimes cost my friends to not want to be around me. Um, but we did resolve it after I realized that I was not acting mature for my age and that I probably should have handled the situation differently. And we'd resolve, but um, it wasn't until I finally learned to control my emotions that the outbreaks finally stopped and I didn't really have too many conflicts with my friends where I was the main problem. Um, so, yeah. Now, was that possibly a product of the fact that the friends that you hang around with or were hanging around with at the time were a couple of years younger than you and they hadn't reached that point in their development where they were having those hormonal struggles where it was affecting their ability to control their emotions. I mean, yeah, my friends, um, my friend, most of my friends were pretty young. The, my, most of my friends were pretty younger than I was were younger than I was, and um, I'd sometimes lash out at them because I'd know, um, because I was just experiencing the emotions, and I had no real reason to control them, but I'd actually go to recess and hang out with my one friend who was the same age as me, and she'd normally help me calm myself down, we'd talk about um, what happened, and we'd just you know, try to calm each other down, and then by the end of the day, I'd apologize to my younger friends, and we'd, and we'd still be, and we'd be back to being friends. Right. And that's usually how conflict resolution works. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing that they do talk about here is the complications of being a teenager compounding conflict resolution. And they say the time 
between adulthood and childhood is full of changes, both physical and emotional. And that's clearly what you were talking about here where the emotional changes were becoming an issue. Um, They say with hormones raging, teenagers often find it difficult to be social. Do you have that issue? Do you find social interaction to be difficult going through this period of you're you're largely through it at this point in time because you you are pretty good at controlling your emotions, but do you find that that was causing social problems for you? I mean, yeah, I kind of started getting a little scared about being around people because I was afraid that at some point I might lash out at them, even if even when they didn't deserve it, and I I kind of just was in fear and kind of just spent most of tried to spend most of the time alone trying to keep my emotions as calm as I could at the time. Now they say that temper tantrums, sulking, and ignoring parents are all standard teenage behavior. Um, You didn't really go through a lot of these. You had some emotional outbursts, but do you think that these symptoms were things that have caused issues with you as far as building conflict with parents, teachers, or friends? I mean, yeah, like I said, the emotional outbursts, sometimes it didn't happen at home. It would happen when I was around other people over the silliest of reasons. And yeah, I'd lash out at people, but it wasn't, um, like horribly often. Like it would happen sometimes. But after I realized this, I tried to hold up all my emotions until I got home. And then I'd basically just, you know, scream. Or let it all out. So most teenagers feel that others just don't get it. Have you ever run into that situation where that's caused some frustration or conflict for you? I mean, sometimes. Especially when I had the sadder outburst where I would just start crying for no real reason. I didn't understand it. And I didn't think you guys would understand it. I, If I didn't understand it, you guys wouldn't be able to understand it. That's basically what I went through. Right. And I think a lot of kids go through that, but I think the thing that that would probably surprise you is how much your parents actually can relate to the situation because we've all been there. You know, times are different, kids are different, but there's fundamental human behaviors that are consistent over the years that all of us have gone through. So I think you'd be surprised at how much insight your parents might be able to to lend to you and how much they do relate to you. They They don't relate to you now. Like one of the things that I tell you is, well, you don't need to worry about this stuff now because the relationships that you have now are insignificant. They're a a blip on the radar of a few years of your life that after you're out of high school is not going to matter. And I totally get the concept that me telling you that doesn't help you because you can't visualize where I'm at now. But it's important to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. What you're going through now is a temporary thing, and it's not going to matter in a few years. And I just hope that knowing that, you can take some solace from that and know that, okay, I just have to get through this right now, and then I won't have to deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, And sometimes I realize that comes across as we just don't get the problems you're running into. And it's not that. It's that we've been there, we've done that. As important and significant as you think these things are now, they're not. And and they won't be in the future. What I think we lose focus on is that they are important to you now and we need to deal with them now. Mm -hmm. Even though they're not going to be there in a few years. So that's where I could see that disconnect where it may seem like we don't get it. Yeah. Um... So conflict resolution skills are something all teenagers must learn. How do you think your skills at teen- at conflict resolution are at this point in time? I mean, I definitely think I'm better than I was before. And I definitely think I can relate to other teenagers who are in the same position as me, where they still have the problem with the emotional their problem with emotional outbursts and um, having conflicts with some of their friends. And I definitely, and one of the things that my teacher actually talked about, um, when we were learning about conflict resolution is that 
when younger people get in a conflict, it's better to have a mediator that is the same age as them, because it's more likely that that person will understand what the what the teenagers are going through and will be able to help them resolve it a little better than most adults will. That's a very good point. We'll have to re- reiterate that when we get to mediation later on. Alrighty. But uh, let's take a little break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the conflict resolution commandments. Alrighty. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back. We are talking conflict resolution today on Insights into Teens. And we have 10 conflict resolution commandments we'll run down real quick that are just sort of guidelines. So commandment one is something we've said already. Conflict is reality. There's no escaping the fact. And hiding won't solve anything. So you kind of need to deal with it. What's number two on the list? Number two is you can't wish the problem away. Don't pretend and put on a mask. Keep your feelings cooped in keeping your feelings keeping your feelings cooped inside won't work. Right. Number three, <clears throat> learn to deal with the problem, not the person. Conflict occurs because of a particular issue, not because of a person. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. There are some people who are born to argue and make conflict, Mm -hmm. but we'll leave it at that. They say don't make it personal. Just deal with the issue. It's a problem-solving thing. Deal with the problem. What's four? Uh, Be respectful. Listen to the other person. Really listen. Listening to your parents or teachers may seem like a drag, but zoning out is not the solution. Right. Commandment five is be assertive. You don't need to be either passive or aggressive to deal with teen conflicts. You need to be assertive. Being assertive means putting your views forward confidently and calmly. Yep. And commandment six is learn to negotiate. This is the most important skill you need to learn. Negotiating is a skill that will serve you in the long term. Commandment seven is stick to the present. Don't drag in past issues. Doing so will only muddy the conflict further. And commandment eight is the silent treatment does not work. Sulking is as bad as getting aggressive. It won't solve the problem. Talk it out. Right. Number nine is be understanding. Try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Don't be defensive and analyze the situation. And finally, Commandment 10 is learn to say sorry. Stand in front of the mirror and practice, if need, if the need be. If you're wrong, accept it. Doing so will not make you look weak. Only a strong person has the strength to say sorry. It's a, this simple word can work like magic. Try it. Yes. So I wanted to kind of focus on a couple of these, but before we do that, I wanted to ask you, of these, were any of these talked about and what you went over in school. Uh, let's see. So, Commandment 1, Conflict is Reality. Yeah, they kind of went over everything that conflict is unavoidable. It is just something. It's like Thanos. It is inevitable. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, you can't wish the problem away. Yeah, you need to have hard work in order to get the problem done. 
Uh, learn to deal with the problem, not the person. Same thing. Don't take it personal. That whole thing. Uh, be respectful. Yeah, we learned about that. Now that one, I have to. I want to dwell for a moment on that one. Okay. And and being respectful, you should always be respectful. Obviously. Yeah. But in the midst of a conflict, it becomes difficult, especially if your emotions get raised. You know, depending on how adamant one side or the other is arguing their point, you can get pretty animated, you can get pretty emotional, and when that happens, you that veil of respectability tends to to fall at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that people start to take things personally. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you maintain your respect for the other person and Never let it get to the point where it's insulting or demeaning. Mm -hmm. What about assertiveness? Did you guys talk about assertiveness? I don't think so, no. So when they talk about assertiveness here, you're familiar with the terms passive-aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're passive, then you're, you're basically going to let people walk all over you. You're not going to say your point. You're not going to stick up for yourself. Yeah. If you're overly aggressive, that's the opposite end of the spectrum. You're basically bullying your way through to conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And that's going to leave ill feelings on other people's part. When you're assertive, you're just making sure that your point of view is heard. You know, you don't want people in conflicts. A lot of times assumptions are made. So people assume they know what you want or they know what your problem is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes their assumptions are incorrect and they're arguing their point of view from an incorrect fact at that point. So when you're assertive, you're making sure that your point of view is very clear. You're making sure that your path to resolution is very clear and that you guys are talking about exactly what needs to be discussed and resolved. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you're pushing your point or you're bullying. You're just making sure that people know what your problem is. Yep. Negotiating. Did they teach you negotiating skills? I mean, they taught us about negotiating and how negotiating um, is good to help resolve conflict. And this is one that I've tried to teach you uh, in the past. It wasn't traditional conflict resolution. When we go to the comic book shows and the pop culture shows that we go to, there's vendors there. And we always try to buy stuff from vendors and we try to get the best price. And the negotiation for that best price is a conflict resolution. So when you negotiate and you want to buy, let's say, a, a picture, and they want to charge you $10 for the picture, that doesn't mean you have to pay $10 for it if they're willing to nego negotiate. And most people at these events are. So you come back with something that's reasonable but not insulting. You say, all right, how about $7? And then they may come back and say, well, nine. And you may meet somewhere in the middle, like $8. That's the negotiation, and that's the conflict resolution. Now, that works the same way in any other conflict resolution. If somebody, you know, if you're at home and somebody breaks your fence and you need to get it fixed, that's a conflict. We need to come to terms. Okay, well, you pay for 50% of the repair, and I'll pay for 50% of the repair or whatever it is. It's still a negotiation. Any conflict resolution is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. The important thing about that is knowing what the value is in what you're negotiating over and being willing to take on some of that burden yourself to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, so stick to the present. Do you know what they mean by this? Uh, yeah. Stick to the present meaning it means that you shouldn't like – Bring up a point like, oh, yeah, well, you did this and now you're doing this. Exactly. You know, oh, well, you know, last week you, you took my pencil and now this week I took yours as payback or something like that. You want to deal with the problem that you have at hand here. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the silent treatment? Well, they did say that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't ignore the problem. Right. Um, so. and, and sulking, you know, when they, when they talk about sulking, it's a matter of, you feel you've been wronged in some way. And instead of dealing with it in the present right now, you're going to sort of 
play that silent treatment and it's going to build up inside of you. So by the time you actually decide to take action for conflict resolution, that's sort of eaten away at you at like a cancer at that point in time. So what was a small problem before, you've sat on it and you've let that wear away at you for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, and now you're angry about it. And now it's a whole different elevation of, of problem where the problem itself hasn't gotten any bigger, but because you haven't dealt with it, it's gotten bigger to you. So you're more likely to overreact at that point in time, get emotional, be disrespectful, and it sort of breaks down that ability to negotiate. Yeah. Understanding. Tell us, tell us what your understanding of understanding is. Understanding, basically, you need to understand the other person's viewpoint as well as your own. And um, like you said before in the first example, like the placement of furniture. Well, for the understanding part, I would we would both want to listen to each other's um, ideas and understand, okay, well, you have that point and I have this point, because then it'll be easier to compromise or negotiate with it. Absolutely. That's a very good way of putting it. And learning to say you're sorry. Now, you don't always have to say you're sorry to resolve a conflict. Mm -hmm. That's important to understand that. You're not, conflict resolution isn't like folding like a cheap lawn chair every time there's a conflict. Yeah. But when you're wrong, you're wrong. Admit to it, say you're sorry, and then try to find a path to resolution. Sometimes that's the hardest part for people, is to admit that they've done something wrong or said something wrong or whatever, and then owning up to it. And I think, to me, that's probably the biggest measure of a person's character, is the ability to recognize when you've done something wrong to recognize it, apologize for it, and then set about correcting that. Because uh, we all make mistakes, right? And what do I always say about mistakes? It's fine to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. Exactly. You learn more from your mistakes than you'll ever learn from your successes. And being humble and being able to say you're sorry builds a tremendous amount of character and a tremendous amount of respect that people will have for you after that. So I think we've touched on all these pretty well. Did you have anything to add to the commandments? Is there anything that we didn't talk about here that you wanted to talk about? Hmm. Not that I know of right now. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the steps to conflict resolution. We've got six steps we're going to talk about here. Uh, and not all of them always apply, but... We'll talk about all of them and uh, make sure everyone understands how best to resolve conflicts. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to this week's edition of Insights into Teens. We are talking conflict resolution. And I think it's time that we talk about steps to conflict resolution. So the first thing is set the stage. They say, agree to try to work together to find a, to find a solution peacefully and establish ground rules. For instance, no name calling, no blaming, no yelling, no interrupting. 
So that's the first step we talk about here. What's our next step? The next step is gather perspectives. Each person describes the dis- dispute 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 from his or her perspective without interruption. Listeners pay close attention and then ask clarifying questions in non threat in a non threatening manner. They consider not only what the other per- uh, participants sa- say they want, but why they want it. For example, if someone insists that you pay s- for something they believe you broke, they might be doing it not because they really care about the object or the money, but because they feel you don't respect them. Addressing the other person's need to feel respected may be key to resolving resolving the conflict. And again, that's another important thing here, is it's not always about the problem. You know, let's go back to the, you broke my fence. Well, okay, you broke my fence... I'm not really concerned about the fence, but I'm kind of upset that like, okay, I got a great example. So we, uh, have a, we had a landscaper that that would come out and cut the lawn for us in the summer. And we had a pool set up at one point in time and he came through and he wound up hitting the pool and damaging the pool. And, you know, we had a difficult time finding this particular kind of pool and he was like, well, I'll just pay for it. And it, it wasn't about the cost of the pool. It was about the recklessness of how he went about doing his job. And the fact that he, he, he didn't have respect for our property at that point in time. It was just, you know, he came through. And I think he hit it with a weed whacker or something like that and tore a, a, a gash in it. And it was more the principle of you're being paid to do a job and you're being paid to do it right yet you didn't do it. And you think, you know, just giving me 20 bucks is going to solve the problem. So that kind of left a bitter taste in my mouth at that point in time. He's not our landscaper anymore because there were other similar incidents that it became a pattern at that point in time that he was not doing his job correctly. So sometimes it's more than, more about just the problem itself, the conflict itself. It is about respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, The third thing that they talk about here is find common interests. Establish which facts and issues all participants agree on and determine why different issues are important to each person. Identify common interests, which can be as simple as a mutual desire to resolve the problem without resorting to violence or a shared need to save face. And this is another one where a lot of times, especially in teens, it's a matter of pride. Well, you called me a name or you called my mom a name and I can't let you get away with it. And a lot of times as a kid, for me at least, you know, I got into a lot of fights over pride. And ultimately, in hindsight, it's a matter of, well, they're words. Words don't matter to me at this point in time. But they did then because I was a teenager. So sometimes that's what it comes down to as well. But you have to make sure they understand why you're offended by it. You can't just be offended by something someone says and then not reveal that to them because they may have a completely different opinion. Another great example. You know, when my mom was still alive, she was very big on birthdays. And to me, birthdays aren't that significant. You know, it's just I survived another year. That's great. Well, when you're... 30 some years old, they're not important. But when you're 60 some years old and there's, you know, you come to the reality that there's only so many birthdays that you get and you start to appreciate that later on in life when there's few of them that you're going to be getting, it's more important. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go to see her. I didn't get her present or anything like that. And I forgot about it. And when she brought it to my attention, she was genuinely hurt. And I didn't understand why, because to me, birthdays weren't significant. So I, I don't, I kind of made light of it. I didn't, I didn't give it the same level of attention that she thought I should have. And I made the situation worse. And in hindsight, I realized that even though it wasn't important to me, it was important to her. So I made sure that I went to see her every birthday at that point in time. And I always made a big deal about it after that. Even to this day, I still go to the cemetery and visit her on her birthday. 
because it was important to her. So that's another thing is understanding the value that people place on things and situations and words and insults. When you do that, then you can understand why they react the way they do. Don't just assume they feel the same way about something that you do. It's important to communicate and find out what their beliefs are. What's number four? Number four is create options. Take the time for each teen to brainstorm about possible solutions to the problem. Come up with a list of options without immediately judging them or feeling committed to them. Try to think of solutions where both people gain something. Think win-win. Too often we assume that one person is to win, the other person has to lose. In reality, it is often possible to think creatively and come up with a solution that both people feel good about, where both walk away feeling that their needs have been met. This is why I don't like math. <laughs> and I've mentioned this to you in the past. I don't like math because there's one answer to all math problems. Mm -hmm. That's the correct answer. And I'm the type of person, in my experience, I like to find options and alternatives. And, and I do this at work all the time. We're presented with problems or we're presented with challenges. And it's up to us to find the best option. So sometimes my boss will go out and make a decision. And it's not the best decision, but it's one that will solve the problem. When he comes to me, I can go through, I can look at what the needs are, what the requirements are. Then I can present options. You know, you have option A, B, and C. Here's the pros and cons of each. Here's the cost of each. This is where we are. Then with those options in hand and that information, we can, as a team, figure out what the best option is for that solution. So having those options is very important. And, and providing those options to people is important. Now, the next step after you create the options is to evaluate those options. After a number of options are suggested, each teen discusses his or her feelings about each of the proposed solutions. Participants will negotiate and often will need to compromise in order to reach a conclusion that is acceptable to both. They may need to agree to disagree about some issues to reach an understanding. And that concept right there is also very important. We don't all agree on everything, and we're not going to. Mm -hmm. This latest election is probably a prime example of that. There are some things that one side will feel that the other side will never feel. And you can argue until you're blue in the face. And you argue to a level of frustration and then you get emotional. You get disrespectful. And it boils into a bigger conflict. Mm -hmm. There are times where you have to just come to the reality that you and I aren't going to agree. So we have to agree to disagree, and that's the common ground that we find. And then let's move on, right? What's number six, the last in our list here? Number six is create an agreement. The teens involved explicitly state their agreement and may even want to write it down. If necessary, they set up a time to check back to see how the agreement is working. Now, that's kind of formal the way they state it there, but I think ultimately every conflict resolution comes down to some kind of agreement. And those agreements invariably always have different terms attached to them. Sometimes it's, you know, I'll borrow this for this week and you get it for next week. Sometimes it's there's a cost and you pay this amount and I'll pay a different amount or whatever it is. So there's always some type of agreement that is reached here, and it's important that you honor that agreement. And, and part of that reason is that if you have a conflict with someone and you come to an agreement and you fail to fulfill your part of that bargain, then your trust level drops off significantly. Mm -hmm. And the next time you have a conflict with that person or someone else, you now have a reputation for not abiding by the terms of your agreements. And it makes it much more difficult to resolve conflicts with others. It makes you look bad in their eyes, in the eyes of your peers, and it leads to more conflicts down the line. So it's very important to have that agreement and formalize it in some way. You know, if you agree to 
pay for the fence because you broke the fence, shake hands and sort of seal the deal there, even if it's just symbolically, so that you know that there is an agreement and that the conflict has come to an end. Um, And the last thing that I wanted to talk about here, and it's not in our notes, but I think it's important to understand that not all conflicts can or will be resolved. Um, and nor will they be resolved to your satisfaction. So you have to be prepared to accept that as an ultimate outcome. Sometimes people just don't agree. Mm-hmm. I've been feuding with my brothers for various things for 20 years now. And I tried numerous times to reach out to them to try to resolve things, to try to patch things up, and they just were not interested in doing so. So there came a point that I had to accept the fact that I'm just not going to be able to resolve this conflict. I had to accept that, and I had to move on. There are times that the resolution, there is a resolution, but it's not one that's ideal for you. And it's one that you may have to live with. You know, I divorced from my first wife. And when that divorce occurred, there was a custody agreement between myself and her uh, regarding our son. And I didn't like it. I didn't get to see him as often as I wanted to see him. It ultimately, you know, it it went on for years. And we made the most of it that we could at the time. But ultimately, it it didn't end as well as I would have liked it to. But it was one of those things where that was the best solution that presented itself at the time, even though it wasn't an ideal solution. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know that not everyone, there's not always a winner and a loser in a conflict resolution. That's, you know, we've mentioned that, but there's not always a resolution either. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand and and analyze what the outcome of that will be and prepare for that too. Mm -hmm. Don't always expect the resolution to come out of it. Did you have anything else to add? Um, hmm, I was just thinking maybe we could talk a bit more about mediators. Okay, tell us, tell you know, let's 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 bring up the idea of mediation because I didn't really cover it here. Yeah, so mediation is something you use if both people are very stand are stood on their are standing on their on their ideas of what's right and what's wrong and don't seem to agree. They get they then get an outside force considered a mediator. And basically the mediator is supposed to hear both sides and hopefully get both of them to come up with either a win-win solution or a compromise. Right. So, so your mediator would be impartial. They wouldn't take a side here. They would listen to the arguments from both sides, kind of like a judge. Mhm. They would listen to the ideas from both sides and then help to propose some of the solutions that are available. Mm -hmm. Uh, The mediator usually doesn't pass judgment. They're there to basically affect communication and to try to get you to cooperate to the point to get to a conflict resolution. Yeah, and it's important to note that your mediator can't really just be anyone. It needs to be someone who has good communication skills and has good problem-solving skills because if you get someone who's not good with that, they might just make the conflict even worse. Right, and you definitely want to make sure you don't get someone who's partial to one side or the other. Like You don't want someone's best friend to be the mediator. Mm -hmm. You want an independent third party to do the mediation for you to ensure that both sides are represented equally. Mm -hmm. Okay, that works. Take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your closing remarks and shout outs. Alrighty. Go for your closing remarks. Okay, so for everyone out there, regardless of your age, like we've said multiple times before, conflict is inevitable it is something that will never go away and will always be there and it's important to try and resolve the conflict as much as you can and important to note that it's not always going to go your way and it's not always going to be able to get resolved so it's important to understand 
and learn how to resolve conflict and know that it's not always going to happen and not everything's going to go in your favor. Okay, very well said. Thank you. Before we go, though, I would invite folks to subscribe to us. Uh, you can catch our video versions of our podcast as Insights into Things. Our audio versions are listed as Insights into Teens. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Amazon. We'd also uh, love to hear from our uh, viewers and listeners out there. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can catch our high-res videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you get a free Twitch Prime subscription that you would uh, would be very appreciative if you threw it our way. Audio versions of our podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. We're on Instagram at insightsintothings, and you can get links to all of this, plus show notes, transcripts, um, and other stuff that I can't think of right now on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you... And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights in the Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights in the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. Well done. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.